Very much so. One obvious difference, of course, is where one injects the botulinum toxin. And so if we look at the four diseases we've discussed, in migraine headache, the injections are in the face and the head. In blepharospasm, around the eyes. Cervical dystonia in the neck. And in spasticity, in the limbs. But one of the interesting questions is, what is the proper dose? What is the best technique to do these injections? And so when we look at dose, we find that the clinical trials tend to have a specified dose that's used in the trial, and that is the dose that usually appears in the FDA-approved label. On the other hand, many clinicians find that they need to inject higher doses of botulinum toxin than are approved in the label, and that's based on their clinical experience and other literature. And when we discuss the developments here at the AAN, just this evening, um, I'm presenting a paper called the Tower Study, in which we used higher doses of incobotulinum toxin, or zeamin, in the treatment of spasticity. From 400 units, which is the FDA-approved dose in the label, and then stepped up to 600 and even 800 units, and found that it was both effective and safe. They certainly come from poison, not quite plague, that's something different, but the toxicity of botulinum toxin goes back hundreds of years in terms of its recognition, and it usually came from poorly processed food, whether it be canned soups or poorly made sausage, and basically botulinum toxin can kill you. It's the most potent poison in nature. But remarkably, in the 60s and 70s, a very clever doctor out in California, Dr. Alan Scott, decided to pioneer the development of this drug for use in humans. And fast forward from then to now, nobody could have predicted where this drug would be today. And frankly, it's being used in so many different fields of medicine for so many different indications, and there are probably more to come. Absolutely. And so, like any drug, there's a positive and a negative, and there's efficacy and toxicity. And with botulinum toxin, toxicity is a very important concern. And if one looks at all the botulinum toxins, one finds a very important warning, in fact, a black box warning on the label, and that warning concerns safety issues. And what are the safety concerns? Well, the less serious ones are if one injects in a muscle, one may produce excess weakness of that muscle, usually temporary and often fairly minor. More seriously, if one injects too high a dose, one could develop what's called systemic spread. That is, the botulinum toxin is taken into the bloodstream, spreads throughout the body, and can affect weakness diffusely, including respiratory muscles with respiratory failure, and there have been some reports of death, particularly in young children with severe cerebral palsy who were previously compromised that had severe systemic reactions. As I've mentioned earlier, the clinicians that are using this drug are expanding dramatically. In the early days, interestingly enough, Dr. Alan Scott, who developed it, was an ophthalmologist. And that was for strabismus in children and various eye spasm disorders, hemifacial spasm and blepharospasm. Then it moved to the neck and cervical dystonia, and those were movement disorder neurologists. Then it moved into numerous other areas, including spasticity. And then you had rehabilitation physicians getting involved, gastrointestinal physicians, urologists with bladder indications. What the public is probably most familiar with when they hear Botox, they think wrinkles. And so who's injecting wrinkles? Well, often they're dermatologists and plastic surgeons. One of the concerns many of us have is proper training. And certainly it's pretty obvious, I would think, but not necessarily common practice in the community that whomever is using this drug needs to understand the science, they need to know the pharmacology, they need to know proper technique, and they need to know toxicity. And particularly in the cosmetic world, there may be some people who are doing this that may not be 
as trained as perhaps they could be. So we spend a lot of time in trying to enhance people's knowledge and education and training so they do it properly and safely. Like many other fields in medicine, I think it's a fair adage in botulinum toxin science in that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And there are many, many open questions that remain as far as future research. Just to highlight a couple of them, one of them is more diseases to treat. For example, one of our big areas of interest right now, particularly in limb injections, are disorders such as focal dystonia or essential tremor. You may be familiar with writer's cramp. Individuals, when they write, their hands go into these very severe abnormal postures. That's a form of focal dystonia, a movement disorder, or people with severe tremor, essential tremor. And we and others have been piloting the use of botulinum toxin in those disorders and are currently conducting placebo-controlled studies. So very exciting new indications. Other important questions to answer we've discussed earlier are dosing. How high can one go so safely? Intervals. Can you shorten the intervals less than three months, as the labels indicate? Antibodies. Does that continue to be a problem with resistance? Mm -hmm. Technique. How do you target muscles properly? EMG, electrical stimulation, ultrasound. And so these are all very fruitful areas for investigation. I'm delighted to say we and our colleagues are involved in some of those studies, but there's no lack of a bright future for botulinum toxin in therapeutics.